Welcome to the FDA Oncology Center of Excellence Conversations on Cancer Public Discussion Series. Today, we are thrilled to bring you a conversation titled Seasons of Change, Oncology Careers. We have a fantastic group joining us today, oncologists who have traversed career changes to and from academia, government, industry, community practice, education, administration, and retirement. I personally have had a longstanding interest in understanding how to build a meaningful professional life and having an open mind about how that might look in different seasons or stages of life. We all go through chapters of life that could be defined by family situation, a shift in priorities, or maybe even the whole profession changes. So when one of our division directors, Harpreet Singh, proposed the idea of this conversation, coming from an interest in the social aspects of how oncologists make career decisions later in life, I said, I want to make this happen. So now I want to thank our audience for joining and turn it over to OCE's director, Rick Patzer, to welcome you to the program. Thank you, Elaine. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, Conversations on Cancer is a ongoing series that we have uh, in the Oncology Center of Excellence. And basically, it is designed to bring social issues and the convergence of social issues in oncology together. And this is one of many topics that we have throughout the year. And we really welcome our panelists here. This is something that I have been looking forward to for many years. Many of the people that are on this panel I have known throughout my career and our our careers have intersected throughout a period of 30 to 40 years basically here in various roles uh, and it's going to be interesting to see how people view changes in oncology over their careers why they went into the field oncology was a much different subspecialty when many of us entered the field uh, it was uh, really in its embryonic form Uh, And it's blossomed into a field that I never imagined uh, it would in when I started in uh, medical oncology in 1979. So it's going to be really a a fascinating discussion to hear many of these leaders that we have organized or have come to this symposium to give us a glimpse in their career of why they went into oncology, what they thought oncology would look like when they started their careers. Uh, what were anticipated changes that they saw coming, what regrets possibly they had, what positive things that they viewed. And obviously at the end, we want to hear of their perspectives of what they see the future of oncology being. So I'll turn it over to back to Elaine and to begin this discussion. And perhaps we should start with everybody introducing themselves. Thank you, Rick. Yes, let's introduce our panel. I'm going to call on each of you and ask you to introduce yourself, um, give a high level summary of your career journey, just the institutions, the types of work you've done. We'll get to the interesting details later. And as always, these conversations are meant to be fun and informal, like we're chatting in a living room. So we'll go by first names. Let's start with Carol. Hi, I'm Carol Miller. I started as a laboratory tech in the laboratory of immunology at the NIH, was blessed to work with an oncologist and a and an immunologist who eventually went to work for the FDA and then changed my decision from what I wanted to do and decided to go to medical school to become an oncologist. After medical school, I did a residency and fellowship at I went to Maryland, then went to Hopkins for residency and fellowship uh, in medical oncology. I joined the transplant uh, program and stayed at Hopkins for a total of about 18 years where I did uh, mainly uh, new drug development and uh, supportive care for patients with hematologic malignancies. Uh, After about 18 years at Hopkins, I had a sort of a major career change. I left Hopkins, but stayed in Baltimore and uh, moved across town to run a mid-sized community cancer center, which is part of a large uh, network of hospitals called Ascension Health. And I have been there since. I am thrilled to be part of this uh, panel and and hear about everybody's experience. Thanks, Carol. Um, How about Karen next? Uh, I went to Columbia Medical School and uh, one of my classmates got Hodgkin's disease. Uh, Actually, it was a classmate from college and went down to the NIH for a, a study 
Uh, this is back in the mid 70s. And uh, he showed up again in September of the following year. And I very untactfully said, what are you doing here? Because he had had stage four Hodgkin's disease. And he said he had gone down and gone on experimental treatment uh, for his Hodgkin's disease and his cohort was doing very well. Thank you very much. And I thought this was spectacular. This was an, somebody with an invariably fatal disease that then got a relatively new drug development, um, uh, combination chemotherapy. And he, he actually subsequently did great. So I went into medical oncology trained at the Dana Farber cancer Institute um, and stayed there for 16 years uh, on the faculty doing uh, sarcomas, mesotheliomas, and breast cancers, bone marrow transplants, supportive care. Uh, we had program project grants. So they taught me how to be an investigator. Uh, our teams got larger. I was recruited to Columbia as a cancer center director, Columbia University, back where I started medical school. Stayed there for 13 years as the Cancer Center Director. We really enjoyed that. And from there to the NIH in the National Cancer Institute, where I was Deputy Director for Clinical and Translational um, Science uh, for a couple of years before being recruited as a dean at Boston University School of Medicine. And certainly the training as uh, in cancer, lab, clinical, public health, it's exactly what cancer centers do. It's the perfect training to be a dean. And so multiple different parts of a career changed over time. Um, and you get to reinvent yourself every decade. Love that, reinvent yourself every decade. Um, so uh, let's go to Mace next. Hi, Mace Rothenberg. Um, my first month of internship at Vanderbilt was spent on the uh, hematology oncology unit. And um, at the end of that month, um, it was interesting because there were three of us who were just fascinated by what we were doing that wasn't able, wasn't possible just a few years before. And all three of us ended up going into hematology oncology. There were another three who basically said, you're, you're kidding yourselves. You're just making sick people sicker before they die. And they went into other specialties. Of this. <laughs> and so it's interesting how one's first rotation in the residency can have a big impact. So after residency, I went to the uh, NIH uh, for, for my fellowship. I stayed on for three more years, uh, getting experience in clinical and translational research. I worked as special assistant to the director of the Division of Cancer Treatment, Bruce Chabner, and became really fascinated with new drug development. Um, I was then recruited to the University of Texas, San Antonio, so right down the highway from MD Anderson, where Rick was. And we were both working in the area of new drug development in GI oncology. Um, and uh, was there for seven years, and really enjoyed bringing two drugs uh, from phase one, early development, all the way through FDA approval, gemcitabine and arinotecan, and both of those happened to be involved in GI cancers, so that kind of now made me somewhat of an expert, by default, of new therapies for those diseases. Uh, in 1998, I was recruited back to Vanderbilt to lead the uh, phase one program, and also got involved in translational research in GI cancer through the SPORE grant from the NIH. So really enjoyed doing that and envisioned myself having a long, happy career in academia. But then in 2008, the phone rang and it was an unexpected opportunity to actually lead oncology clinical drug development uh, at Pfizer. And uh, after thinking long and hard about a, a transition from academia to industry, decided that I could make a, a even bigger impact in what I was doing working with an industry. So I, I was there working, leading oncology clinical drug development for 10 years, during which time we brought 11 new cancer drugs to the market. And then in uh, 2019, I was asked to become chief medical officer for Pfizer, a time that coincided with the development of the COVID vaccine. So I had a front row seat for that. I retired from Pfizer in full-time employment in, in March of 2021. And since that time, I've kept myself busy in science, medicine, and drug development through various boards, consulting, uh, and other activities. So really pleased to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Melanie next? Thank you. It's really a pleasure to be with these esteemed colleagues. Um, I started really in the late 1980s to early 1990s with a PhD 
at the University of Cincinnati. And my work was really on carcinogenesis and mutagenesis. So what do you know? <laughs> I'd end up in oncology, sort of. I didn't know that then, but um, after my PhD, uh, actually overlapping some years, I was also taking a, a degree in medicine. Uh, and at that point, after my uh, residency, I said, I'm going to oncology. There were five of us in the group that were going to oncology and they, th they thought we were nuts. Yeah. You know, why would you go into oncology? And I actually remember telling some of my colleagues, you wait, in the future, oncology will be it. <laughs> and what do you know? It was very prophetic because many changes, we were understanding cellular processes faster than you could keep up. And that was really my inkling that something big is going to happen in oncology. And um, my husband told me, enough of this cold weather, find somewhere to train where it's warm. And what do you know? MD Anderson, that's where I went. And that's where I met Dr. Pastor. Uh, I stayed at MD Anderson after my fellowship at the uh, breast uh, department. And I thought I would have a career in uh, academia for the rest of my life. And perhaps the majority of that would be at MD Anderson. Several of my uh, mentors were uh, in MD Anderson for a very long time. But uh, Dr. Cheryl Wilman from the University of New Mexico called me and said, listen, you are needed here. Here, you can have an impact on the lives of people who need a NCI designated cancer center. Those words resonated very well to me. And so I moved from uh, Houston, Texas to the University of New Mexico. I was there for 17 years. Uh, I was asked really, I was one of the first uh, recruits for, the, uh, for them to convert from their P20, which is their cancer center planning grant, to their uh, P30 grant, which is for NCI designation, and then eventually a comprehensive cancer center designation. And that was an experience that I find very invaluable. So from being director of the um, breast program, and then eventually uh, running their um, research office or the uh, being chair of their PRMC, and then eventually um, things happened in my personal life that we can talk about that, that uh, made me think, wait a minute, I'm not getting any younger. Uh, I barely see my husband. Actually, he also worked at the cancer center and that's the only place where I saw him awake. At night, I saw him asleep. Uh, so I said, there's gotta be a change in my life. And then um, where else could I be in public service? And come to mind, FDA. I knew Dr. Pastor. I knew he had a career that was very fulfilling. And so I think that this was the right move for me. And I'm very happy with that move. Thank you, Melanie. And last but certainly not least, Bill. Thanks, uh, Elaine. I, I was a uh, second year resident at Geisinger Medical Center in Danville, Pennsylvania when the United States Navy invited me to join them at the Philadelphia Naval Hospital as a general medical officer. And um, when I first got that news, I, oh my goodness, I want to finish my residency, so on and so forth. Turned out to be probably one of the most important uh, points of my life. Uh, I had two years of being a general, like a general practitioner, and there I realized I wanted to subspecialize. What I want to subspecialize in? Well, finally I thought cancer. If you do something for a cancer patient, that really has a big impact. Plus, one of my mentors in my residency was an oncologist who was kind of a role model for me. So I decided to pursue a fellowship. I went back to my hometown of Chicago, and I was a fellow at Rush University Medical Center, two years of medical oncology. I'm definitely an old dinosaur in today's day and age because I stayed at that institution for a total of 47 years. And um, when I went, when I finished my fellowship, I was asked to stay on the staff, and I did that. And I was a general oncologist, and I eventually evolved more and more into a thoracic oncologist. During the first 15 years, I was participant in ECOG studies and GOG studies, cervical cancer. 
And then in um, 2002, I was asked to be the director of the section of medical oncology. I wasn't really looking to, uh, for a leadership position, but I thought, well, I can help the people. I can help them mentor the people in the, in the section, and then I can help the section to grow. So I took that, and I st stepped out of doing cooperative group work. I still did clinical trials, and throughout my career, I saw a lot of patients. Every Pretty much, I had periods where I saw patients five days a week, inpatient, you know, outpatients, and inpatients, too. <laughs> so one of my recommendations to people is, is a little more balance. <laughs> it was a little too heavy on the clinical and not as heavy on some of the other things. Uh, and then uh, during, as a director of the division, uh, I still saw a lot of patients, still participated in clinical trials and investigator-initiated trials at Rush. Uh, and then in 2016, I stepped down as the director of the division, continued to work for another five years as an oncologist, and I became more interested in database studies and, and in cancer cachexia, and I retired in June of 2022. And um, since then, I've continued to work on some of our translation or re translational research projects related to cancer cachexia. And, and uh, so I, I like doing this, and I, I, I don't regret for one second having made that decision to go into oncology. I forgot last, one last thing, teaching. I love teaching. We did it kind of as a preceptorship at Rush. You sign a fellow and they'd work with you for that whole year. And uh, one of my greatest uh, uh, satisfactions is seeing uh, the people who have gone on, at, with Rick being an example of that, so highly successful, has done so much good for the field of oncology and many others have too. So that was very gratifying. Wonderful. I'm hearing a theme, I think, of... Hey, what about me? Oh. <laughs> I've always forgotten. <laughs> I'll come back to that yes. forgotten story, okay? Because there's a story here. <laughs> Rick, yes, let's, let's hear your story. That one is great. Well, I never was going to go into oncology, okay? Uh, I was all set uh, and signed up for a cardiology fellowship. Uh, and uh, I was at an institution where cardiology reigned supreme. They ran the entire hospital in the 1970s, okay? It was a cath mecca, so to speak. And I was one of the cogs in that cath mecca and uh, cardiac catheterization I'm talking about. And during my residency, my last year of my residency, uh, after I was all signed up for my cardiology fellowship, they said, Rick, since you're going into cardiology, why don't you like take three months in the cath lab because we have an opening there and we could really use you there. And you could, you know, like get a feeling of what, you know, cardiology is like. Well, I did the cath lab for three months and I said, I can't do this for the rest of my life. This is the most boring thing in the world to be stuck in this basement with a lead apron, sticking catheters in people and describing their coronary arteries, basically. Uh, and it was like, I can't, just can't do this. So I was scrambling because I had already signed up for my cardiology fellowship for another um, area, uh, and I was taking a oncology rotation in a community hospital. And I said, this is kind of interesting. And, uh, you know, it's kind of a, a new field here. And I, I got to find out if there's any openings. So I went down to the, the um, gift shop and got $10 worth of quarters, went to the phone booth, that was the phone booth in 1970s, closed the door and just started calling up all of the programs. And I called up Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's and lo and behold, they had an opening, like somebody dropped out. So I said, I'll take it, it's from Chicago, I don't have to leave. And that's how I got into oncology basically. Uh, and I've never had any regrets after that. Uh, I did two years with Phil or uh, in the program there. And to give you some idea, uh, that Rush was the largest program in the city at that time. And it had, I believe, only 12 medical oncologists. And I always say, I couldn't believe they actually had one person that specialized in only one tumor, and that was Janet, the late Janet Walter. And I couldn't believe that somebody could be so subspecialized just to do one tumor. It was like an anathema to me. But anyway, I did 
oncology for two years at Rush and then another year at University of Chicago doing hematological malignancies and other solid tumors also. And I happened to pick up a New England Journal of Medicine uh, want ads, and I saw a want ad for a faculty position at Wayne State in Detroit. I had no idea, I had never heard of Wayne State before, other than sending some patients for phase one studies there, and discovered they had a fantastic program that was probably larger than anything in the uh, city of Chicago. It had about 40 or 50 medical oncologists at that time with departments specializing in various diseases, breast cancer, lung cancer, uh, GI malignancies, et cetera, and was on the faculty there for eight years. I uh, ran the fellowship program there, and I echo Phil's comments that uh, it's very rewarding to see your trainees blossom, and then opened up the one ads again and saw one ad for MD Anderson telephoned an old mentor and he said, come on down, Rick. And I spent 13 years there and was very happy again, running the uh, phase one drug program there, as well as some colon cancer research programs there. Uh, and um, was intent on spending my entire life at MD Anderson. I had come with some of the pharmaceutical companies to the FDA uh, to uh, sell the FDA on some of the drugs that we were working on. Okay, uh, so I know what it's like to be on the other side of the table. And then again, guess what happened? I was looking at the New England Journal of Medicine one ads, and I saw an advertisement, one at Director of Oncology. And I said, huh, this has potential. Uh, so I applied uh, in 1999 and the rest is history, so to speak. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> hey, could I tell a story about being forgotten? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> forgotten? Okay, and this Phil will understand, okay? Uh, this was after I was, I, I graduated, I, I was completing my fellowship at Rush Presbyterian, and they had this big, this, the guy that run the program used to have these big, uh, uh, parties in the physician dining room where they serve these jumbo shrimp cocktails and all of this fancy food. And the guy got up, stepped up on the chair and was reading everybody's uh, accolades of all of the fellows. So he went over this fellow that was graduating, that fellow was graduating, that fellow was graduating. And he said, let's give everybody a hand here, a applause and welcome our, our, congratulate our graduating class. Guess what he forgot? He forgot me. Okay. <laughs> I didn't say anything. Uh, and I just like left the party, pissed off, obviously. And uh, you know who that was, Phil. I won't oh, I do. <laughs> and he was so embarrassed, he called me into his office and had a party especially for me. <laughs> So that's my forgotten story, which you forgot about, Elaine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're a co-moderator, but you have as much experience to share as any of the model, the panelists. Um, so I'm hearing from a lot of you that things did not necessarily turn out the way you expected to, or how you imagined your career um, at the beginning may not be how it actually ended up. And so I want to hear more about how your career goals changed over time. Um, maybe Mace, you can start us off. Sure thing. When, when I was thinking about this question, I realized there's a thread that runs through my entire career. And that is, how could I contribute to the greatest of my ability? So that goes all the way back to when I was a medical student and there would be a cardiac arrest going on. People would be doing things that I had just watched before and had no ability to do, like running the code, uh, intubating the patient. Um, but there were things that I could do, like drawing bloods. So I, I saw what I could do and I did it. And I think that recognizing that at every step along the way, uh, what I could do uh, that would really help uh, move uh, uh, the field forward, what would help, help patients, what would help the program, what would help my colleagues. So early on, when I was uh, a fellow, uh, just learning about what opportunities there were in the laboratory, in the clinic, recognizing 
where my skills were because I had a year in the laboratory and I realized I could do this, but I didn't have the same feeling and passion for, for actually seeing patients. And, and, and I was very fascinated with new drug development. So you know, that informed my uh, decision to accept a, a position working with the director of the Division of Cancer Treatment where new drugs that are being developed at that time kind of coordinated, and, and one of the drugs was, was Taxol, Taxus brevifolia. And uh, it was uh, derived from the uh, bark of the Pacific yew tree, and, and that office was trying to help coordinate the harvesting of that bark with the uh, derivation of that, of that new experimental drug at the time. And so um, you know, doing things that, that could really help was in, in one of my responsibilities in that role, helping to uh, coordinate uh, scientific meetings um, that I had a chance to uh, meet Dan Von Hoff, who was one of the speakers at that meeting. And then a few months after that, he called me up and he said, I think you have a, an opportunity that might be well-suited for you, your interests and your background. And so I realized that I could actually go from an office where I was helping other uh, uh, programs to work and develop and get access to investigational drugs, to actually rolling up my sleeves and being a, a participant in one of the largest programs of its uh, type at the time. So I, I, I moved to San Antonio. I never planned on that. It was an opportunity for me to actually contribute more. I, was, I had the background. I was ready to take that next step. Um, got great experience um, in those seven years working with a variety of drugs, designing phase one trials, recognizing that the design of each trial should be tailored to the particular qualities of that drug. There wasn't a cookie cutter approach. Uh, how we could work with the laboratory, not only for forms of kinetic, but for biomarkers. So all the things that I learned during the time, and then got a call about going back to Vanderbilt and actually leading the phase one program. So I was ready, I think, to take that next step up. And with each step along my career path, uh, it was a bit of an unexpected opportunity, but it made me reflect on where I was at that point in my career, and that I felt I had reached a plateau. And that this was now an opportunity for me to take the skills and, and knowledge that I had developed and to now apply them to have even a bigger impact. So that's really the thread that took me from San Antonio to Nashville and Vanderbilt, and then from Vanderbilt to Pfizer, and now Pfizer onto the boards. And, and so um, it really has been tremendously rewarding because I think um, just the way I, I, my constitution is, I like to challenge myself in, in new ways. And I continue to do that even after I've left full-time employment. Others want to jump in on this? Sure. Other panel? Well, I'll I jump think... in, Rick. I, I think that, um, I'm... go ahead, Carol, please. Oh, I'm just saying it's, it's interesting what Elaine said about how, you know, our careers paths change over time. But I think if you listen to all of us, our commitment to oncology as our as our passion and our guiding light hasn't changed. And I just was reading an article recently that 96% of oncologists at the end of the, their career, if asked if they would stay, if they would do it again, 96% said yes, which is the highest of any specialty. And it is because it is a always changing field. You can never get bored with it. Uh, when I started, I thought I was going to be in laboratory research. That was where I was going to be. I was, you know, going to do basic science or basic oncology uh, in my fellowship. And then just like uh, Rick said about going into the cath lab and saying, this isn't for me, I decided I was a clinician first and a clinical research researcher second, and then switched over to be able to do clinical research uh, and patient care at Hopkins. And I loved it. I got to do some really interesting research um, and clinical practice brought some great drugs, um, worked with a lot of great drugs and great patients. But somewhere I decided I wanted to be more in a, a smaller hospital where I was part of the community, not just um, the community of the physicians, but the outreach into the community as well, which is where I decided to take what I learned at Hopkins and what I learned from uh, caring for patients in an academic center to build, you know, a bigger program that reached uh, in, in a community and in and the community I serve is a very, um, you know, inner city, uh, you know, uh, 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 population, um, and it's and and you can, uh, it's been a great experience for me. So I, oh, oncology always, but I I've gotten back more into 
you know, continuing research in the community, which is needed in there where they can get to research and good clinical practice in a community based hospital is where I've sort of found where I fit the best. And I'm going to stay here and at some point retire from this and and join Mace on some boards uh, in the community that I've served as an oncologist. Phil, you want to jump in? Well, I think uh, both uh, Carol and Mace, first of all, they, they found their passion. And I didn't think for, you know, people looking for a roadmap and how he or she should go about their career. You need to find your passion. And I think the other key thing, and, and, and both um, Carol and Mace kept this in mind, keep an open mind. Look, see, and you know, say, ah, I don't just, you know, I, mean, I remember back when I, immunology, because we had a lot of that at Rush, as you remember, and we had, I see, we yeah. saw all the resounding failures one after another, but I, my, I give credit to the people that didn't give up on it. They figured out the immune checkpoint inhibitor, and immune checkpoints, and obviously there's an explosion of progress. Uh, and the other, in terms of what you're doing. When I went into the, the oncology, I thought progress was opposite of what you thought. I thought it was going to be really fast, Rick, but it, but it wasn't fast at all. It was 30 years in lung cancer before there was some real major breakthrough, and that was the targeted therapies. But I think passion, for, find your passion, keep an open mind. Uh, your passion might change. So follow it. Karen, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I thought I was going to be a, an oncologist taking care of patients, uh, but Columbia and then Harvard kept telling me that you had to, quote, move the field. So they they helped you learn how to write a grant, a, a training grant. Uh, I did what they told me. I, they It said the goal uh, for the grant, I said I was going to cure cancer. They said, no, 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 no. Your, your goal is one little tiny part of that. Uh, so they taught me how to write a grant. And then I was sitting in the lab for a couple of years because that, that, that was supposed to be your way to a career in oncology at a respected uh, research dense medical school. And I, I kind of didn't feel, I'm like Mace a little bit. I didn't go to medical school to cure uh, tumors and hamsters. Uh, I wanted something a little bit more cl clinical. And just then Tom Fry got to be the president of uh, CALGB. He needed an assistant who could help write protocols. And that was a terrific learning experience because we would go visit cancer centers, all, all of the people who were in the group. Uh, we were doing a lot of phase one, well, mostly phase two drugs and all of those protocols. We did protocols so that you didn't actually have to read them as carefully because the only thing that got swapped out was the drug part um, so that you wouldn't make mistakes. Um, and so I met some like Dan Van Hoff, a lot of the names that, that you know, we, we, I met all of them at the meetings and they were all chairs of the, these were all the heroes that were the chairs of the various drug companies or drug studies. And then one day Tom Fry calls me into his office and says that uh, the PI of one of the program project grants has just been recruited to Duke and the grant was due in three weeks. He knew I could write by that time. And so we, we wrote this grant for the bone marrow transplant program in three weeks. I hadn't transplanted anybody, but between the time that we wrote the grant and the time the site visit occurred, I had transplanted 52 people. So we got, we got the grant. Um, you know, it's months and months between the application and whatever. Um, meanwhile, the Europeans were telling me that sarcomas were responding to iphosphamide. So I actually filed the IND. People told me how at the FDA, they were very helpful, uh, how to do an IND for iphosphamide. I think that when, when, when they commercialized iphosphamide, they actually cross-filed on my original IND. <laughs> Um, so, so you 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 learn these things, and they help you in the next step. Uh, and the next step is obviously working to to make the next generation of oncologists. So that's becoming a, a, a division chief for oncology. That you had the fellows, uh, the cancer center, and and then going to the NIH. I was always interested in global health. I was an exchange student in Czechoslovakia when I was in college. And so, and, and I saw my first operation in Budapest, not the United States. Um, and they convinced me that going 
medicine was okay for a woman because basically everybody in the United States kept telling me that that wasn't the case, but they had 50% of their doctors are women. So uh, at the NIH, they deployed me to Jordan for a while because we had a cancer center there. You remember it was the... Um, there was the Gulf War, and because of uh, depleted uranium, there were plenty of children who developed ALL, and they would airlift them over to the King Hussein Cancer Center in Jordan, and uh, we would get them into remission and send them back. So, so you you find you have different stages of your career. Meanwhile, we had two kids, my husband and I. He's a cardiologist. Um, and they, so did he get stuck in a cath lab? <laughs> no, he did not. <laughs> he was doing the same new drug development in the intensive <laughs> <laughs> I want to do that, but we took the kids all over. And, and when, when you, the wonderful thing about academia is that you get to see the health of other countries from your colleagues in other countries. We took the kids too. They're both doctors, by the way, and they married classmates. So we have six docs in the family. Oh. <laughs> uh, so, so things change over time. I, I really meant the reinvent yourself every decade if you can, because basically that keeps you on a learning curve. I, it sounds like everybody else was doing that too, because you were switching after a while. One of the things I wanted to talk about is I had a perception when I, in 19, late 1970s, when I started, I had a perception, you know, I was thinking about what would oncology look like? And I got to say, I was completely wrong. Okay. But it reflected what was going on on oncology. First of all, I thought all drugs would come from the NCI. Secondly, no pharmaceutical companies would be interested in oncology, the reason why. Uh, oncology had a lot of stigma associated with it. Remember, this was even before Betty Ford, et cetera. The drugs were toxic. There wasn't really a commercial market. The short-term use, um, uh, you couldn't make a profit off of them. Uh, they were toxic. P companies didn't want to get associated with this kind of morbid situation of death and dying in oncology, so to speak. And I, I thought most of the practice uh, would occur in uh, academic centers. I said, you know, these therapies are so marginal, okay? Uh, you know, uh, it's, everybody should be going on protocols and, you know, this is the thing, you know, everybody should be going on protocols. And here again, I couldn't be more wrong in my thoughts. A, you know, 40% of all pharmaceutical activity is now in the field of oncology. So I was completely wrong on that, believe me. Uh, they've made an economic model. Number two, to uh, basically uh, still only 5% of patients, if that, go on clinical trials. So it wasn't a, a, a area of burgeoning clinical trial enrollment, so to speak, uh, in the United States, at least. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, you know, private practice oncology is where the bulk of patients in the United States are, um, are treated. So I, I'm wondering, did other people have concepts of how the field might have changed during their career when they, you know, from a retrospective type of thing, looking forward, what did you think the field would look like? Did anybody have the same kind of experience that I did? Or maybe I'm unique in that. I don't know. Anyone I think one of the amazing that? things is the change in the longevity of your relationship with your patients. Um, when I was a fellow and early faculty, you either cured them in solved for five years and, and then they you know, went back to their primate cares or you didn't cure them and, and they died from their disease. I, you know, I did clinical trials with uh, the uh, uh, imantinib in uh, 99 and 20 some years later, I have a bunch of patients who still come and see me every uh, three to six months, depending on whether they're on or off drug, because we even actually have been able to stop some of the drugs. And so the concept of my oncology patients worrying about when I'm going to retire, I never thought I would get to that. And that's sort of the wonders of, you know, what we learn through clinical research, that if you know what turns a cancer cell on and off and how to control it, you can alter the lives for the long term. Even if you have to keep giving them therapy, it's still a pretty amazing uh, uh, treatment option for patients. So that's what I've noticed as changing. I never thought that we would be where we are now with long, long-term 
patients still requiring therapy. I remember when I was a resident um, and was decided to go into oncology, um, I would tell people, and rather than saying, oh, isn't that wonderful, they say, isn't that depressing? And I would have to tell them, no, I see it as very hopeful that the field is changing faster than any other field in medicine. And all the challenges we face today are things that we may be able to overcome tomorrow. So I, I guess that's my nature is being an optimist. And you have to be an optimist to yeah. be an oncologist, to be in drug development. But I think that uh, we've been very fortunate to have our careers over these past 30 and 40 years because I don't think any field has changed nearly as much as oncology has during the time. But much of that change has occurred within the past 20 years, basically, That's a nice. lot of it. The first 10 years of my career, especially being in GI oncology, was how do you get five of you in 10 different ways? Okay. <laughs> uh, and that was it, okay, which was like mind-numbing, so to speak. And then, obviously, other drugs came out of Reno Teak and Oxaliplat, et cetera. But here again, it, it wasn't the same explosion as we're seeing now, which really, I think, represents a lot of the groundwork that had been done from the basic sciences throughout this period of time. And we're seeing the fruition of a lot of that work, so to speak. Other comments, Melanie, you have anything? Yeah, you have? I mean, perspective wise, as you know, I'm my career is probably half uh, the number of decades that most of the panel have. But uh, even in the beginning there, um, you know, 2000, you have already beginning explosion of some chemotherapies, but then eventually the targeted therapies later in the uh, latter decade of that. So I don't have that sort of further on perspective, but even prior to that, with the background in cell biology and our you know, beginning understanding of cellular processes, I was very hopeful that oncology would really change in terms of landscape. And I echo Carol's uh, sentiment. I still have patients who call me on my personal cell phone today and say, Happy New Year, you know, Merry Christmas. They're very <coughs> thankful because they thought, you know, they would not be around to celebrate another milestone. But in fact, they have. And, you know, that's to thanks of many oncologists people in government who look at uh, all this application in pharma. So we all are a community, uh, whether we uh, like it or not, we really are in the same soup. Mm -hmm. Melanie, I love hearing about these personal relationships that you have with patients. And I'm sure it was a hard decision to leave that and come to FDA and Back to having an open mind that um, many of us, uh, many of panelists have mentioned. How did you make that decision to come to FDA and make a pretty drastic change? Yeah, so um, before answering that question, um, I, I want to share a little bit of how I sort of make my choices in life, right? So first you have to have what you call a guiding star because, you know, values, uh, Many different values are presented to you at any one point. So how do you judge which value you would follow versus not? Many things that happen in life can be accidental, but your next step should be a chosen one rather than an accidental one. Although Dr. Uh, you know, Karen's, uh, uh, what she said, you have to learn to reinvent yourself. I first heard that with Madonna, you know, the singer <laughs> <laughs> who always reinvents herself. Well, guess what? As a medical doctor and, you know, if you have another uh, degree, you are one of the most highly educated people in the world. So why should you box yourself to any one choice when you are at a crossroad? When you're at a crossroad, Look at all your choices and see where lies your passion, where lies your, when you get up in the morning, you will jump up with joy because you are happy with what you're doing. If you lose that, life is simply just, you know, day after day after day. So um, that was, that certainly governed my transition from MD Anderson, where I could have uh, had a very good academic life. But, you know, the, the service, essentially doing something for people, 
meant a lot to me when I moved to New Mexico because they're an underserved population. And so that was one of my garden life, that your life should be also of service and not just a life for yourself. Family is important to me. That helped me decide to go to MD Anderson because my husband said, look, I don't want to be stuck somewhere cold anymore. I've been wanting to go somewhere warm. I can train as equally well at the NCI or Memorial Sloan as well as I can at MD Anderson. So guess what? That, that was the choice. But the other, uh, other issue, of course, is uh, what uh, Rick said, that the, 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 uh, the treatment uh, is now in the uh, community. But when I was at, at the University of New Mexico, you know, we, uh, when, when the CICA program got reorganized and became the ANCOR program, I was the PI for their ANCOR program. And we really showcased the fact that we were a state, our catchment is statewide, and that we had satellite sites almost everywhere in the state, and we were going to take care and provide research, clinical participation, clinical research to those that lived, you know, in, in, uh, in far communities from the cancer center through our satellite systems. And, uh, you know, the NCI really loved that, that we could offer those. But, you know, one thing happened in my life. It was, a, it, it was already there, but I just accidentally found out about it. I have a genetic mutation. And all of a sudden, my one of my values had to be, your health is important. It was never really in one of my, you know, I, I exercised, I ate uh, fairly well, but it wasn't number one. And then I realized I can't, if something happened to me, I can't just drop my patients. Uh, I don't know if all oncologists, clinical oncologists have this sort of guilt feeling that, I can't be just uh, asking my colleagues to take care of my patients or just suddenly drop out and my patients have no one. So I said, I have to make a choice in my career what I should do where it's still meaningful, it's still serving the public, and I can still do something. And guess what? Rick first came to my mind and I said, I need to know whether moving to the FDA is the right choice. And it was. Let's go to the others, okay? Because uh, what do other people want to talk about? I got a question for you, which is kind of a loaded question, uh, but I want to hear before I ask this question about uh, other uh, other people's point of views. Uh, this loaded question is: the biggest regret of my career is blank. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I could start. Um, okay. early, early in my career, um, when in, in my year, my two years in the laboratory, we were working in multi-drug resistance, um, and it was um, you know, very compelling. We were working with patient samples. Um, it was a, a, a protein that was expressed. It did act as an efflux drug transporter. And we were identifying drugs that could potentially block it, some of which some drugs were, were clinically available. And so there was an opportunity to actually write the clinical trial to test that hypothesis in patients. But I felt that nobody else was talking about it. No one else was doing it. And therefore, there must be some flaw to it. So I didn't. And it was only a year or two later that people began to write those protocols. It had limited impact, but the, the key is but I didn't have the self-confidence at that time to say, you know what, there may be some things that you have a little bit deeper insight into. That you have a unique perspective to relate that to other issues and to be able to do something that others haven't done yet. So I look back on that, and that was a very important lesson learned. And I now have, when I've, when I've encountered similar situations, I've been confident enough to be able to take that step forward, and it's often been the right step. Others want to jump into the regret question? Yes. My biggest regret is early in my career, I wasn't very good at work-life balance. It got better as I went along, and of course, it's much better now. <laughs> but yeah, it's in it. You, you were a patient machine, as you said. <laughs> it was too much. And, and you know, one of the uh, Frank Hendrickson, who was the chairman of radiation therapy at Rush, he gave me the advice. He said, you know, you just keep learning, 
try to have work-life balance and your career kind of takes care of itself. And I, <clears throat> I think there's a lot of truth in that, but I, I think, and I think the, the younger generations now, I think they're really very cognizant of, they want work-life balance and I, that's important. And I can tell you from somebody who wasn't so good at that, I, that is my regret. Yeah, I, I see that, uh, you know, I, I do the interviews, uh, I interview all of our medical mm -hmm. officers, uh, and there's, uh, I, I'm, I'm very impressed about the number of highly qualified people that we have from really fantastic training programs uh, that are coming to the FDA. And that's, you know, not a conventional pathway of what mm -hmm. physicians see themselves doing. You know, people think of going into academic medicine, private practice, but, you know, the FDA, as I always say, nobody writes on their medical school application as a reason for going to medical school is to work at the FDA, that's for sure. So, you know, like we see that, and I, I think one of the major issues is a work-life balance, okay, so to speak, especially when you have potentially two physician careers, so to speak. It, it's very, and children, it's very hard to uh, be in ex certainly private practice. And uh, certainly, you know, academic medicine has changed dramatically. And perhaps we could also talk about that. But um, what other regrets, anybody want to share other other issues that they're doing? I want to go back to what Phil said about my generation. I'm what's called a geriatric millennial. And I do agree that our generation is focused on work-life balance. And I talk about this with other people like fellows who are graduating and looking for jobs. Um, but is do you think anybody can answer this? Is my generation too focused on work-life balance? Um, is there such thing as making up for it as Phil is doing now in retirement at the end of at the end of your career can you make up for work life balance no you miss some opportunities elaine with when your kids are young yeah you miss those if you don't do it so uh, don't don't miss those but but I, I think also there are generational aspects that also reflect social changes in the society, et cetera, that has occurred during this 40-year period of time. Right. And we can even talk at one of the questions that I wanted to ask, since we have a array of female oncologists here, is the role of female physicians in general and how it has, uh, you know, uh, really changed throughout one's career. Uh, with now, I believe there are more female uh, medical students than male medical schools in many uh, across the United States, which was would be unheard of when I started medical school. Um, and, uh, you know, inroads in traditionally male uh, dominated specialty, so to speak, uh, for orthopedic surgery and urology, et cetera, so to speak. Uh, Apparently, the, the number of women at this point, the fraction is about 51 percent. So it is a majority mm -hmm. across yes. the United States schools yeah. area. Yeah. Uh, but I think that that this the as as Richard said, I think that the culture has changed. The generation before us kind of had a kick butt strategy of teaching medical students and residents and things like that. It's it was what what's the matter? Can't you take it? And so everybody was was trying to do this um career that was that where you had to prove how tough you were and one of my colleagues said that he was glad to see women around because they would say why would anybody want to do that um and so i think that women did change medicine to a certain extent i think that this generation changed medicine because we saw what happened and we don't run medicine that way anymore. We realized that balance is really important because it wasn't so great for us. And we also have a bigger, broader view. The European physicians do not work 80 hour and 120 hour work weeks. They work a work week that's much more like, and the academics too, much more like um, 40 to 50 hours, maybe. So I think that all of us are getting a broader view and finding that that we can be better doctors, better academics, better teachers, if we basically take also have a, a component of our life that wasn't allowed in the past. And a happier person too. Happy, you, make a better, you make a much better doctor if you're a full, um, a, a, a multi-dimensional physician. 
especially in oncology. And Karen, as a leader in a medical school, have you been able to change policies to help facilitate more? Well, the call schedules and stuff, Karen, they, they've changed. It's totally, it's totally ex expected at this point. You, you, the residencies would lose their residency if they, if they work people over uh, the, the work hours they're supposed to have. Um, I personally think that people should be allowed to take care of their patients until there's a break in the medical issue and then make it up later uh, because I don't think that people should be ripped away from their very, very sick patients uh, just because they're running out of uh, the time. So I think that that's actually been an important change, but we, we, we had, we've emphasized wellness as does every other medical school at this point uh, and balance. And it's important for you to make better doctors, mm -hmm. not just in oncology. People burn out. You you don't do anybody good if any good if you if you're if you burn out. Yeah, Mace, I wanted to turn to you and talk about uh, one of our favorite subjects here at the FDA, and that is regulated industry, so to speak, and how you see industry has changed throughout your career. Obviously, you've you've had a unique opportunity of seeing industry from both sides of the table, so to speak, as an investigator, um, as a, uh, a member of the pharma uh, uh, industry, so to speak. And could you talk about that? Because uh, I've definitely seen changes, uh, and all of us have seen it, obviously, on how we interact uh, with the pharmaceutical industry. Gone are the days of... Uh, you know, a, a lot of largesse, so to speak. Uh, and uh, what did you comment on that? Yeah, well, well, there are several dimensions to that answer. First, um, because we have an all oncology group here, I'd just like to point out that oncology is different than other divisions within the FDA. And that really it's a reflection of what you've achieved over the 20 plus years that you've been there, Rick, in terms of taking the regulations, which change every so often, very slowly, very rarely, and then interpreting them and putting a, um, uh, an understanding of how we can incorporate new opportunities, new science, new endpoints, new ways of measuring the risk-benefit relationship. So it really has led oncology to be the leading division within the FDA in terms of, uh, of adapting those new changes into the way the regulations are applied. When I, I became CMO, um, I, I was surprised when I began interacting with some of the other groups within Pfizer. And I, they, they would have a question about what next step they should take. And I would often say, have you reached out to the review division at the agency? And they looked at me like, why would we do that? I said, because they may be able to provide you with some guidance. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, they basically are just citing the regulations. And that really surprised me and disappointed me. So just to give others, I know you can't say anything like this, so, so I'm saying this, that uh -huh. oncology has really benefited and really is at the forefront of this, uh, in incorporating new uh, approaches based on, on the science. The second element that, that I realized was that as much a, of, a, of an effort as we made over the years for regulatory harmonization, we're not there yet and that other regulatory agencies will have different concerns about a filing um, than the FDA would. And it puts sponsors in a difficult position to say, okay, if we design our pivotal trial in this way, we're going to be pissing off some regulatory agency. Which one? Well, I, I just have to laugh. We This morning we had a, a cluster call with all of our international colleagues, including EMA, Canada, Aust uh, Australia, uh, you know, many of them. And you could see these differences of opinions. And many of them are held very strongly. And we can't force our opinions on anyone, that's for sure. And uh, one of the division directors said, we appreciate your viewpoints, but we want to share you, we think, in a very diplomatic fashion, you're wrong. But it wasn't a polite way of saying that, but she probably did as best as she could to point that out. But I have to had to chuckle when you, you brought that up because it, it, it is true. And what people don't realize is obviously there is a great deal of subjectivity 
not in the data itself, but in the interpretation of the data, because even within the FDA, within our review staff, uh, there could be differences of opinion. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, and, you know, we have to discuss that and hopefully come to a collective unity uh, as a group. But uh, that just happens. That's just the, uh, and I'm sure the same thing happens in the pharmaceutical industry. There's different viewpoints on, on what one should do with a given set of data and how one should interpret it. And, and I think understanding how the interaction between a sponsor and the FDA could be a very productive one. And I think what uh, a lot of companies don't realize is the FDA, as, I've, as you've said in these meetings, we're not going to solve, your, you're not going to develop your medicine for you. We're not going to tell you. But instead, to bring several options to be able to explain the rationale between each of those options and to establish a dialogue. And I think that especially when, in my experience, when you have a first-in-class molecule that really can address an unmet medical need, the agency has been very interactive. Um, and we saw that, especially with the COVID-19 vaccine, where things that normally would have taken weeks or if not months were dealt with uh, over some phone calls over a few minutes or hours. It's, it's recognizing that what is often viewed as this uh, agency, this uh, uh, monolithic. faceless and monolithic agency, can actually be very flexible and responsive when it arises. But there's a dark side to that as well. I mean, I think that people are, we have to realize that, um, that we, we have to continue to have the public trust and show where i mean where the data goes and the science goes i think it's been incredibly disappointing in the recently about the lack of interest in, not from the fda or things but from the community in, in in um in respecting knowledge as uh in as compared to opinions and i think the fda and the oncology community has been pretty strong about despite you know, in, in general, making sure we're following the data. And I think that's really important um, to continue to do. Um, you know, I, I love I love rules. That's why it's nice being an oncologist. There's a lot of rules to follow. Well, that brings us to the issue of medical distrust, so to speak. And you see that uh, rampant uh, in today's society. Uh, I don't know if it's fostered somewhat by the political divide, but also by social media, et cetera, where anybody could say anything to an audience and people just accept it. I, I'm shocked at some of the things that I consider very intelligent people accepting as fact because uh, somebody somebody said it, okay, and it feed, feeds into their kind of narrative of what they believe, so to speak. Uh, and I think that's uh, always, and especially this came out with the vaccines and vaccine resistance and even the acceptance of some of the uh, COVID therapeutics too. Uh, I, I wasn't going to bring this up because it's not specifically related to oncology, but it, it, I just can't help myself. But because actually our careers were trying to address unmet medical needs of our, of our patients. And that has actually now ex expanded in, in my life to actually addressing this very issue. How do you restore, restore the trust that has been lost over these last few years, not just because of COVID and the vaccines, but in general, medicine and medical advances? And uh, through a series of conversations that actually started years ago, but over the last year, it's really accelerated. Um, I've, I've actually been spending the majority of my time not on a board and not consulting, but actually leading a new non-for-profit um, uh, for, to create a museum of medicine, biomedical discovery. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, I've had a series of meetings. We have a board. This is at the early stages, but there needs to be a, a venue where people understand the connection between science and medical advances uh, that restores their trust and faith in that system and has people have a place where they could understand and put this into perspective and context, not just about what's affecting our society today, but the diseases that have been addressed and overcome over decades and centuries. So stay tuned, it's as early as stages, but uh, we're moving forward with this effort. Ace, that's really exciting, and I'm hearing that you're really proud of this. Um, and I think something that I, I want to hear from everybody is, 
what are you most proud of and what do you want your legacy to be? What do you want to be known for? Um, because many of you have done some very interesting things and just broad range of things. That's a tough one, but I, I do think what I'd like to be remembered for is being a, a doctor who built a great team that was able to give compassionate, data-driven care and support my community, not just medically, but also socially. Um, I think that as, as oncologists, we have a special way of, you know, it, it, we and as doctors as a whole, we need to give back to our communities outside of the hospital as well as in the hospital. So that's what I am proud that I think I am doing at this point in my career. Uh, I can jump in here and I, I frequently refer to uh, my uh, reviewers and staff as all my children, so to speak. And uh, they, they could be there at that age, so to speak, that they could be my children. Uh, and I spent most of my life and, you know, we talked about threads in your career and one of the reasons didn't necessarily have to do with oncology, but one of the things very early on, really even in high school, I realized I wanted to be involved in academic medicine. And that's why I moved to various academic places and was head of fellowship programs, et cetera, uh, both at Anderson, at Wayne State. And then even here, really, we have a huge educational program and we spend a lot of time in teaching both community, but primarily our review staff. And one of my, my greatest things is I look back at my mentors and really uh, they, they will forever live in my mind. And I hope that the people that I have trained will look at me favorably uh, in the sense of uh, when I am long and gone, uh, long and gone uh, from this world that they will say, I remember that guy from Calumet City, Illinois, okay, <laughs> from the south side of Chicago. He helped me remember this or understand this. Uh, and I, I view him from a really positive light. And that's what I strive for, basically. A lot of that has to do, I, I don't have any children, so uh, that's why I use that phrase loosely as all my children, because I, I really do have a concern for them, um, and I hope that shows. Many times when people come and tell me that they're leaving, they expect me to argue with them, and I say, no, you need to take chances. Uh, if this is a good career opportunity, I don't want you to stay here to make the FDA better. I want you to develop your career okay and that's my greatest pleasure to see people move out you know there's always this thing about the revolving door between pharmaceutical industry and the fda and mace knows about that it's played up quite heavily in trade press and the press i don't look at that as a bad thing i just look at it as a normal thing that people will have different careers as we've all had here so to speak others want to comment Rich, I think a stint in government actually helps to broaden people in almost no matter what they do after that. So a stint at the FDA would be great for some. Well, Karen, at least they're used to bureaucracy. That's <laughs> yeah. for sure. You can't get more bureaucratic than this. They, they, they try to, they, they know how to avoid it. Uh, but you, you talk about your academic children. I even I have biological children, but I, I, I also really value the, the people that I know that we had conversations about, would you stay in academic medicine? Would you go into private practice? And I kind of talk, tried to talk them into going into academic medicine. Even people who were originally in the clinical trials office at the Dana-Farber when I was a baby uh, junior uh, faculty person, we had technicians that then went to medical school, got MD, PhDs, and and now are full professors at respected medical schools. So it's it. I think that your academic children are absolutely your legacy in a way. Was it Phil talking about legacy before, or was it Mace? I, I, it was one of you. Phil. It's the next generation. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, one of the things I wanted to ask uh, also is. Men, all of you have been in academic medicine. How has that changed over your career? And has the change been for the positive or negative? 
Phil, you're on the screen and you oh, have, definitely. you're retired definitely. so you can give us the truth. Oh, okay. definitely, definitely positive. Really? Uh, I, I think what we see, uh, you know, obviously a lot of progress. We see people have become subspecialists for one disease or a few diseases and they get much, whatever you do more of, you get better at it and you're better at teaching it. So that's good too. Uh, and uh, I, I think, and again, we have many women, fe females now, uh, in, in medicine, and as it should be. You know, and, I'm, and I'm talking condition. about also, Phil, the documentation, the procedures, the pressures that are on the physicians. Do you think well, they're here, greater? Yeah. So, Rick, yeah, electronic record is great because you can read it and you have better documentation, but it needs to be really severely pared down. And uh, because I would say, if I saw the, towards the end of my career, patients four days a week, four full days a week, I spent another full day, either in the morning, evening, weekend, finishing the notes. But that part is, is not good. And we need to try to figure out a way to, to make that more efficient. Others want to comment the changes in academic medicine? I think there's Maybe. a much broader res respect for different, um, for different aspects of research. It, when I was junior, it was lab only, was the only thing that counted. And then it was clinical research started to count. Then people discovered that public health was important. And then there was the, the extra uh, translation from the results of a trial to the population. So there was population health and outcomes. So there, there are multiple kinds of things that now have respect in academia that had no respect at the beginning. Yeah, because before it was, you, you were either, you know, you had to have a lab and NIH grants and see patients and do this and be a teacher, blah, 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 blah. And that's exactly. almost humanly impossible for anybody to do, especially as fields got more complicated and basic research became more complicated uh, and you were competing against full-time PhD physicians that had their own full-time programs postdocs, et cetera. This would put most people at a, a great disadvantage. Others want to comment on this. Um, Carol? Or, or I see Mason on the screen. Well, we, we all know what attracted us into these careers um, many years ago. Uh, we were drawn to the field um, and the fact that we could be physician investigators um, in that model. Um, and uh, over the course of our careers, that model has changed um, in, in, in some ways that we don't even recognize anymore. So I think people look back and say, gee, if I uh, uh, had the decision to make, make all over again today, would I make the same decision? What we don't realize is you're viewing that from a 30 or 40 year lens, but you have to view it from today's lens. People who are coming up in the field today, they're just as excited to enter the field of academia today as we were, we entered it 30 and 40 years ago. They're seeing things for, through a different lens and appreciating things in ways that we don't. So I think it's, it's constantly changing and, and change is, 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 is good. Um, you know, some changes put more onus and pressure on one group or another, and you could argue whether that is a good or bad thing, but we often don't remember the things that we no longer have to do, we're no longer burdened by, they're replaced by new burdens. That's why it's difficult. We don't have to refer in pho a phone calls. We can re refer, uh, return texts. Right. <laughs> Melody, any comments you want to make on this? Yes, and I think uh, it refers mainly to um, you know medical school and uh, postgraduate training, and that is one of the things that I noticed when I was in academia is that there were fellows that were extremely great. We wanted to retain them within the academia. They're interested in clinical research or basic research. But two, for instance, come to mind very, uh, very prominently. And they said to me, I wish Dr. Royce, I could stay in academia, but I have kids and I have loans to pay. And when I asked them how much their loans were, I was flabbergasted, you know, 250,000 to educate themselves as doctors. I mean, who would want to be burdened with that loan? The last thing you want to say is to say to your child, I can't send you to school because I'm a doctor. That's like, what the heck does that mean? Because they come out with so much debt 
something has to change for that because how would we retain these people who want to stay in academia, but the but the monetary rewards of academia is not sufficient for them to take care of themselves and their family and the loans that they have to bear. That's a very important topic. Um, I think we've touched on a few things in academia that could be drawbacks, could be burdens. And I think in every job, there are, there are things that are not ideal and there's no perfect job. There are things that you won't like. So even though we all want to have passion, wake up every day and be excited to work, what advice would you have for young oncologists who see the less than desirable aspects of their job? And um, how do you work through those days when you're not excited? <laughs> Well, as as my late wife used to say, and Phil knows her knew her very well because she was his nurse. Okay, if the job was so great, they wouldn't have to pay you, Rick. Every time I would come home and complain about a job, <laughs> <laughs> and that was her wisdom, and she was a very wise woman. Um, and I, I think the issue is every every job has a hassle, okay? You know, there isn't any perfect job, so to speak. Every, everybody has a headache, so to speak, and you have to balance them out and kind of step back and say, uh, you know, uh, I got to give myself a break here and, and kind of think about what's going on and what are the big picture issues. I can't tell you how many times I get calls from people that are in industry or academic medicine or whatever. And they call me and they want a job at the FDA. And I realized they don't want a job at the FDA. They had a bad day, okay? They want an escape, okay? And uh, I always tell people, you never want to move away from something. You want to move toward something, okay, in your career. And so I'm talking to them, and they're complaining, complaining, complaining. And it says, do you even know what we do here at the FDA? Oh, yeah, you do, like, book reports on drugs or something like that. You know, like, they have no faintest idea what we're doing here. But you, you, get, you have to step back and realize, world's not perfect you're going to have bad days and good days and figure out you know what's the composite so to speak and, and i think that's true of everybody because there's a hassle you know a mean patient an argumentative patient if you're in patient care uh, a crazy drug company that's screaming at you, telling you you don't know what the hell you're doing and you should be fired. You're killing people. Uh, you have no idea what you're doing. You should be canned from your job immediately. You know, we all have these crazy things that go on in our lives, so to speak, and deal with people. But I, I think that's the, one of the major things is really taking a big picture view of your job and not getting, getting discouraged because we're all going to have bad days, that's for sure. We all have to acknowledge that being an oncologist is hard. And you have to tell that to the new people that are coming in. It's incredibly rewarding. It's incredibly um, exciting yeah. and scientifically. But it is not an easy specialty because a lot, you make a lot of tough decisions. Sometimes you make them right. Sometimes you make them wrong. And and you have patients who are having the worst time of their life. And what um, and you're, you know, and then you're adding on talking to them about bad drugs and then paying for these drugs, you know, I, I, um, where I work, you know, I often say, uh, well, you know, cause I involved in some community, um, uh, boards and things, you know, why do you, you know, why are you concerned about this and this? I said, well, for my patients in Southwest Baltimore, when they come in, sometimes cancer isn't the biggest problem in their life. And that's sort of amazing, uh, mm -hmm. to me. And so it makes me think, mm -hmm. you know, that I can take care of this part of their life but they have so many other things building up and 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 deal to to deal with that I've got to be strong and and support them in how I can. But what we do is tough. It's expensive. It puts a lot. It's it and it's and it's stressful both for us and for the patients we serve. And we just have. And so what I tell people: Do you want to be an oncologist? And if you're going to do it, you got to really love it because it's not easy. Mm -hmm. And most people, when they do it, love it, which is great. Since time is running out, I, one of the closing questions that I have for all of you is the following. My most memorable patient was, and let's not give names, but was and why, or is. 
Phil, you've gone through so, so many patients in your career. Yet you know, with your name written on it. I, and I'd uh, love to hear it. I still remember the name of the patient you wrote one of your first papers on. It was okay. <laughs> cases with neuron carcinoma, and I bet you do too. Yes. <laughs> but actually, what I remember most is here at the end of my career, I've got a handful of non-small cell lung cancer patients with brain metastases. They got treated either with immunotherapy or chemo and immunotherapy, metastases in other sites, and a number of them are five years out and free of disease off therapy. I mean, I never thought I'd see that in my career. I never thought I'd see that. But not, we're not just talking about one. I got about probably four or five, just unbelievable. They didn't need brain think? radiation because they weren't symptomatic. But what, they, what, they how, how did you treat what what's that? How did you treat them to succeed in that? Uh or they were they incredibly lucky? How did you well, you know, about in non-small cell, it's probably okay. around 20% of the patients who get treated with immunotherapy alone or chemoimmuno, uh, they are looking like they're long-term survivors. You know, you stop the therapy and they're still in remission. That's but great. to me, it's most incredible because brain metastases were such a horrendous prognosis. And to see that during my lifetime, part of the reason I, I did agonize some about retiring as I, I like doing this. I like seeing, we like seeing people doing better. <laughs> Nothing better than helping somebody who's sick to feel better. It's a wonderful feeling. <laughs> and I, I, I just am I'm grateful I had the opportunity and I, all of us had the opportunity to do that. I have a patient who was on the phase two imantinib and, and accelerated phase CML in 1999, who I still follow, who's now six years off the drug in a, full remission in a PCR of negative state. And just being through his journey through that, he was on three different clinical trials, loved it, uh, works for the Leukemia Lymphoma Society and is on our IRB and here at St. At Ascension St. Agnes giving back to us. But to think of that, I mean, that is one of the you know pivotal things I remember uh, about my career that this accelerated phase never got a transplant and is off drug that far down the road. So that's my my greatest patient memory. Others? We had a Jehovah's Witness minister who came in with the crit of 15 and a GI stromal tumor. They bleed like mad. Uh, and, a, and a fistula to his to the surface. And we had phase one imatinib for GI stromal tumors at that point. The surgeons wouldn't operate on them because with a crit of 15, you have no wiggle room whatsoever from a medical perspective. So we basically, um, you couldn't also give him the pill because basically the fistula was actually, it, the pill would just pop out. So we put a Foley catheter in the fistula, blew it up, you know, gave him the pill. Um, wow. And he he had a very nice response to the imatinib with his GI stromal tumor. His crit came up to about 32 and the surgeons took it out. It, <laughs> it, it, it was just kind of like we did everything we could. And Rich, you're going to have a fit because I told you that his crit was 15. So we got, <laughs> we got zinged on using the drug, but but he did fine. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that this is a favorite, but it's, uh, it's something that I think about a lot. And it, it revolves around, and I'll just use this as a, a case example, but there are many that fit into this in my memory. Uh, a, a man that was in his late 30s that was a in Detroit when I was working there at Wayne State that had CML. And at that time, obviously, we just had hydroxyurea and busulfan, basically. And, uh, you know, he man was not that dissimilar in age from myself. And you saw this person go from chronic accelerated blast and death, basically. And I always think of him uh, as a kind of emblematic patient, because now this man probably would be living a normal life expectancy. And that has always given me that hope for the future. And, you know, I, I've seen so many, you know, major therapeutic advances. Uh, Phil, I, I don't, when we, when I was first working with you in the 1970s, 
the only treatment for renal cell carcinoma was your favorite drug, Megase, basically. <laughs> Which that was it. That was it. There were no, that interferon didn't even exist at that time. That was it, basically. <laughs> and now I'm not talking about it being a curative therapy, but obviously, you know, we have so many therapeutic options that are available to us. And you see this in, in so many other diseases where uh, there have been, you know, major advances, including lung cancer, breast cancer, at GI stromal tumor is a disease that did not even exist at that time, basically, in anybody's lexicon. Um, so, you know, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon to take a look back at where we've come uh, as far as a specialty in, in one's career uh, and what the impact is on those patients that, you know, didn't benefit because these drugs were not available, but we got to know those patients and, you know, a sense of sadness that I have that, you know, we didn't have those drugs. And there's no, no one to blame or anything. It's just being at the wrong time, at the wrong place, in the wrong place in history, basically, when one gets a disease sometimes. I, I have a, a similar story to yours of a patient I treated at the NIH when I was a fellow, and he had an aggressive lymphoma. <laughs> he would come in, and he was just really upbeat. Um, he was a gentleman in his 50s, um, and he, he not only lifted the spirits of those um, um, around him, but also other patients in the staff. It was, it was really wonderful. And then, unfortunately, his uh, lymphoma progressed after treatment, and I remember seeing him come into the hospital, not the clinic, but the hospital, because he was so sick. And uh, he just uh, looked at me and said, I, I just want you to keep me comfortable. And he did it with a uh, a courage that um, really has stayed with me all over these 40 years. And I, I think we may not be aware on a day-to-day -day basis that every patient we see is put in this position, not by choice, um, not by desire, but by chance uh, that they end up being a cancer patient and uh, how courageous they are to go through what they go through every day uh, how their lives have been turned upside down by this disease. And it really is a privilege to be able to be a participant um, and, and help them get through this today much more successfully than we did 40 years ago, but it's still a sacred privilege. Well, this hour and a half really wrapped up relatively quickly. Okay, we have four minutes left here. And if we could just go around and what you see the future being of oncology. Okay, um, let's f focus on the future. And here again, we have four minutes, so let's make a quick, a quick uh, assessment of what the future of oncology. And Carol has a smile on, so I'm calling <laughs> on her. <laughs> a drug for every mutation and a mutation for every drug. Uh, uh, the personalized medicine in oncology to the fullest. Melanie. Yeah, exactly that. that will, <laughs> there will be more therapies for patients and they will be more selective. Okay, Karen. Identifying people at risk and preventing it in the first place. Bill. Continued improvement of immunotherapy with uh, long, increasing numbers of long-term survivors. And MACE. New platforms uh, for therapies uh, that are don't fall into the existing categories of chemotherapy, or radiotherapy, or targeted therapy, or immunotherapy, things like mRNA therapies, things like uh, t targeted protein degradation. Uh, if you look back over the last few decades, the biggest advances have been made every 10 years with the introduction of a new platform. And Richard, what's yours? Uh, similar to yours, I, I feel you know an emphasis has to be placed on prevention and early detection. I, I think that's one of the major things. I see obviously earlier detection by uh, circulating tumor cells or whatever, and then uh, getting that on a, a, a yearly basis as kind of a normal physical examination, and then uh, detecting tumors before they're clinically apparent. And then I, I'm a big believer in immunotherapy, as Phil is, and that will, since these are immunological diseases, basically uh, be giving the drugs 
not PD-1 drugs necessarily, but the next generation of these drugs, so to speak, to uh, really er very early patients. And I believe that what we're even seeing with the PD-1 drugs, the true benefit of these patients, of these drugs, are going to be in the neoadjuvant setting in the very early disease settings rather than in metastatic disease. Okay. okay. Elaine, any closing comments before I just thank everybody? Well, of course, I appreciate everyone's time. I especially appreciate how you all are visionaries and all of these closing comments have <clears throat> really given me an inspiring vision of the future. Well, I want to thank everybody. This was a great conversation on cancer. The hour and a half went by really fast, and uh, let's do it again sometime in another 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> By that time, we'll have new drugs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. Thanks again, everybody. And uh, thank you for the support staff that work with us on this, uh, getting uh, the uh, AV setups and the numerous calls, et cetera, and getting everybody together. And we have a terrific staff here at the FDA that does this. And I want to acknowledge uh, all those that have participated in putting this program together, including our great host, Elaine. Thank you, Elaine. Well nice done. Job. And Bye. Laura Thank for you. her couple minutes of panic when none of us could get on the phone call. So Bye. thank you for <laughs> great. Okay. Thanks thank everybody for including me. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.